could give us a little idea about what a walk around Philadelphia would mean physically and, and quite why that project began uh, that prompted the, uh, the anthology. So um, Philadelphia is a colonial city, obviously, from um, founded in 1681. Um, it's very historic in the United States. It's the place where um, the Declaration of Independence was signed. It was the first U.S. capital. Um, and so it's, I, I actually, I come from the West Coast originally, so I settled in a city that has layers of history. It was a, it's a, an over 300 year old city, which is not old by the standards of Girona, but is old by the standards of the United States and has, so has many, many layers of history and many layers of stories. It has, I'll, um, I'll be talking about this to the people in Girona, um, on, I mean, not here in Girona, but on Friday, but it's a city with a very um, strong and well-defined center but it's also a city that grew over time. So the decision that I was working with two other artists in different fields, a photographer and a performing artist, we had an assignment to come up with a project in a week. The idea was that we could do in a week, that the idea was to cross pollinate, to cross pollinate genres. We all were interested in the city, we were interested in movement, we threw out various words like pilgrimage and thinking about borders, what's a way to look at the city, and we decided to walk around the whole the whole city, the whole perimeter. It's 100 and it turned out to be 103 miles. It took us five and a half days. It was a, you know, what people say, a life-changing experience. It really made me think about movement, how movement relates to my writing, but also how and how, um, how I think about the city. It just expanded my view of the city and made me more interested in stories about the city. I should say that Ways of Walking has, um, because we are, I'm based in Philadelphia, the press is based in Philadelphia, and we ended up, we have a lot of Philadelphia voices, but it's not um, predominantly about Philadelphia. So I just want to get that clear as well. But it is, it, I think most of the people who are Philadelphians in this book love Philadelphia and are inspired by it. But you've got essays on Los An walking in Los yes. Angeles, walking in Geneva, walking uh, in Chile, um, walking uh, the Via Appia Antica through all of Rome, I mean, through all of Italy, and uh, from Brindisi to Rome is one of the essays. Uh, Sir, um, Yasser Alham wrote an essay about his escaping Syria at crossing, trying to get across the Jordanian border. So there walking are a lot of London. It's, hmm? Walking in London. Yes, yes, walking in London. So, okay, well, the, the next question that would follow on is why did you choose the essays that you did for the anthology? How, how much curating as the editor did you do? Well, it was, um, it was an interesting curation process. It started with, there were a few stories that I knew that I, that I knew of specific walks that people had taken and I wanted to include them. Um, and then once I started with that, I also asked writers I knew um, who like Nathaniel, um, like Justin, who I thought would have something to say about walking, knew that they would be interested um, in contributing, and then started also asking writers I knew who are other writers who could contribute. Um, and it grew from there. And then it was something like looking at, well, there might be pieces that are missing. I really wanted it to be a complete, as complete as possible of a picture of the different ways of walking. So Nathaniel talked about the essay about walking in London the essay about walking in London is a, a woman who has cerebral palsy. She goes to London um, thinking that she can walk as freely as Virginia Woolf, who's one of her heroes, and discovers that London, if you um, ha have a disability or also especially trying to navigate in a wheelchair, is not, she can't beat Virginia Woolf. So it's a really, uh, it's a very moving essay and, and really wonderful. So we, so those were people that I, I started finding them as I tried to make the book more complete. Um, okay, so of course, uh, because we're recording this outside, uh, we have noises off. So we now have a car alarm going off in the background. <laughs> so I'm sorry if other people can hear that, uh, but hopefully it's uh, not too intrusive. Um, uh, anyway, uh, talking of Philadelphia, just to begin there, when you talk about it, it 
being a, a city for 300 years, it obviously has lots of conflicted histories. Yes. And that was something that I uh, read in all of the essays, mm -hmm. was there was this um, uh, overrunning, overriding issue of uh, confliction, if that be contested histories. Mm -hmm. So uh, would you like to choose, uh, because we could talk on, uh, you know, we, we discussed this earlier, and we decided that we, we we could end up talking about every topic under the sun with walking. Mm -hmm. But uh, we were talking about uh, something we were interested in as a threesome was um, how uh, our modern lives uh, as pedestrians have been uh, devalued. Um, should we should we explore that a little, a little bit to begin with? Gerd, Nathan, do you want to have a... Yeah, I was going to say, um, you know, we live in a physical world that is utterly dehumanized, but then there, there are ways in which walking is more complicated depending on who you are, such as someone who has uh, palsy or uh, someone um, who has to endure racism or someone who lives in a place where walking is actually impossible, uh, physically impossible. So. In that sense, we were talking about, well, is walking a subversive act? And I think it would be valuable um, to call on one of our Zoomers, uh, not Zoom, sorry. Uh, blue Jeansers. Blue Jeansers <laughs> um, to speak directly to that question. Uh, and I would say both Talela and Cabrilla wrote about, I mean, I'll just say walking while black. Uh, Cabrilla really addresses in her essay and Kalela really um, looks at the, the, the conflicted, the, hit, the contested history that one encounters on the streets of, a, of any city. You could walk around Girona and, yes. and encounter contested history. That's the point of walking. That's what walking <laughs> reveals to you if you know how to look and walk at the same time. So um, I would suggest that we we ask. Yes, we, I think we, they we, talk. We, we turn it uh, towards the the computer somehow. Okay. <laughs> I don't know how to do that. Uh, are the other authors willing to, to chat? Yeah, please do. Um, okay, I'll go. Oh, I'm mute. Go ahead, go ahead. No, Kalila, it was just, I was looking at you and I'm like, I want Kalila to go first, so. Um, I mean, I, I think that, I think that um, mobility um, historically for, um, for black folks in many places um, is, is, can be subversive. Um, there has been many, one of the things that I talk about in, in my essay are um, historically, in Philadelphia at least, um, because I'm describing taking folks on a tour, a historic tour, and um, Nathaniel mentioned contested history. And, um, and so this is the history that's in plain sight. It's right there, we're at the Independence Hall, you know, we're at Independence Hall, this textbook worthy, um, spread of buildings, um, but at the same time, the, the history there is emphasizing our founding fathers, um, and it's not emphasizing my founding fathers, <laughs> um, who are in fact our founding fathers. So, um, so, so there's that, there's, 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 there's the, the historic tour element of, um, of, yes, this is absolutely subversive because I'm telling a history that um, that is absolutely true and is absolutely there just as much as anybody else's, but at the same time, it's not there. It's not there in front of us and we have to look for it. Um, so that's one thing. And then the other thing is just simply, um, I talk about some personal history and some historic, um, just this idea of, um, of things that happened in Philadelphia's history and 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 in and, and, and black history in general, and that is um, that is constraints on mobility, um, and that's something that we have seen, you know, certainly in this country from um, enslavement upwards. Um, so so that's that's um, you know everything from from your pinioned to uh, a plantation or to a factory or to wherever it is that you're forced to work to, you can't take the trolley um, because it's segregated to, you can't take the bus um, or you have to sit in the back or you have to stand if there are no seats um, because it's segregated. So, you know, the, what would be in the memories of my, of my own parents. So, um, so yes, absolutely. Being able to move freely and talk about history is, is completely subversive. Um, I'll jump in and say that my essay was purely about 
you know, my body and my vessel as I walk. Um, because a little bit picking off, picking off of what Belila just said, um, people stare at you when you walk. You know, they observe you, they form opinions, depending on where you decide to walk, they can really make you feel uncomfortable. Um, and that when you decide to walk by yourself of a certain color, of a certain gender, that you are consciously deciding that despite what is happening out there, even if it's only a mile away from where you live, you are willing to take that risk. And it could be perceived risk or it could be real risk. Um, I, I wrote in my essay <laughs> that I hope that the pol a police car wasn't in front of my apartment building um, because the across the street from my apartment building is a parking lot next to a school and often the patrol car sits there. And I remember really wanting them not to be present so I could go for a walk and not feel like they're watching me as I, I start my walk. And those are the small things and nuances that I try to elevate that some people don't get to just be invisible as they walk. Um, they're observed and sometimes ridiculed as they walk. Um, and when you decide to take a walk in spite of those things, it can be very subversive. Um, but also likewise that, you know, sometimes we just need movement to feel a sense of, of peace, um, despite what's happening in the world around us. And I feel like that's important too. Um given but what, but what both of you guys have talked about, how all of this relates to writing. So how does writing help us process all of this? Or why do we think writing and walking are so connected from a corporal standpoint? Like, and why is that important when we're talking about walking as subversive? I throw that out. I do either of the authors want to pick that up or I, anybody yeah, anybody, anybody want to pick take that one uh, I, I could start really quickly um, uh, it is interesting uh, being a walker and a white man it's a it's a different it mine is a different essay and it is a different experience and it's not necessarily Debris was talking about you know I can be seen, I can be judged and all that kind of stuff, but it's a question of recourse, right? How, if things go sideways, um, does that turn out and what are the odds and how much are the odds in my favor in that situation? What, you know, what kind of recourse I have? But um, the question of, of subversion, um, I think is one of, what, what I think is, can be subversive about walking is putting yourself physically in the place. I mean, I think there's the part about the, pr there is a mental process that can happen with walking. It is a, it is a repetitive kind of med can be kind of meditative process. But um, I think just putting yourself out there where you can bear witness to what you actually see rather than what you were told or what you hold as your own, you know, naive or mistaken belief, or, you know, you can also see that you're right about something. But I think that it is um, a going and finding out for yourself that is that can be quite subversive. Um, and I'll leave it at that and let um, Kuala or Cabria take that up if they want. As a writer, um, because the thing was like, well, how does this relate to writing? And Justin was right. The, the motion of walking can be very meditative. And writing for me is a means to process. Long before anybody ever reads what I write, I write it for myself to figure out what what exactly is going on around this thing. And when Anne approached me about actually submitting to this anthology, it was coming at a really difficult time where I personally was feeling stagnant and didn't quite know how to put into words what was going on um, and going on an actual walk help facilitate that process. I think that there is something to be said about movement in the body 
um, that allows for creative outlet. I, I, I absolutely agree. Um, I think that things just sort of break loose in my head. Um, I can almost feel it. Um, I can almost feel things just like pulling away from their moorings. Um, when I'm, when the process of walking is, um, jostling things in my head. Um, and sometimes, you know, if I'm stuck on something or even if I just need to get my brain going in the mornings, um, when I'm writing, if I have time, um, and a lot of times, of course, I'm writing in snatches, but let's assume that I have like, oh, weekend to write, woo, um, <laughs> becoming more and more rare these days. But, um, but I, I'll go for a walk in the, I'll go for a walk before I get started, and I'll go for multiple walks um, during the day. Um, one of the most like. I went to a writing residency at one point and I probably logged so many miles um, because I, I almost walked as much as I wrote because I call it thought work. It's just as important, you know, to get this story in your head, to get these characters in your head, to figure out what's going on with them. Um, and again, I'm talking about writing fiction and then to get home and let the muse take over and, you know, okay, I got it from here. Um, and then you're just that sort of conduit. But, um, but the physical act of, of walking to me is absolutely tied, um, connected to the act of writing and one can't exist without the other for me. Uh, so I think for me, one of the things, and I write a, about this partly in my essay, is that I was, as a child, I was not very athletic, and um, I grew up at a time when there was a kind of mind-body division. So if you were um, smart or considered you know, academic in any way, there weren't as many physical outlets. I also grew up in Los Angeles, which was a city that is famous for a place that you don't walk. But I did walk, um, but it took me a long time to kind of realize that the importance of making a mind-body connection, that movement is part of the creative process, that being physical um, is a way to move and to claim that. I mean, in a way that's sort of subversive in our, in our culture, especially American culture, that you're not an athletic person, but you can walk. And one of the things I've been thinking a lot about, and writing is like this too, is that we get a lot of messages in our society that we need more, we need to be more, we need to have more. But walking, you just need yourself. You just need your body, you just need your two feet, and you can move. And writing, you need a pen and a piece of paper. I mean, yes, we we, we rely on our computers and things like that. But they're both arts, if you call them arts, that don't require all the stuff that society is telling us that we need. And the other thing that I think both writing and walking are really important to me have to do with um, anything that stimulates and creates a, um, a mind of attention. That Because I think that's the other thing that our society, and I would say that's related to both car culture and internet culture, is that we're being distracted and we're told to be distracted and to create awareness is to be in the present moment. And writing is something that helps me see and understand and process experiences that I've had or create um, or make creative um, experiences as well. And walking is the same. It's a way to be in the present. It's a way to keep fostering attention to what's around you and keep that set those senses going and alive and alert. And I would add, um, you know, it's interesting. I think there's two ways of thinking. Maybe there's much more than two ways of thinking about walking. But one is our sort of romantic way, some of which we're touching on. Walking awakens you. Walking gets you thinking. Walking is counter modernity. You know, all these kinds of things that make us feel great when we walk. But also walking is, is an act of subversion or confrontation. <clears throat> or even justice. If you um, yourself are walking to confront things that you know exist in the world or find them, or lead, as Kalela does and she talks about in her essay, leads other people very subtly, very, very um, uh, in, a, in the way that you're showing, you're just letting people see, you're teaching people how to see as they're walking. I mean, 
there is, and I'm using seeing as a, as a metaphor for sensing, right? Because it's not just seeing, but you're learn, you're you're becoming aware as you walk, and that awareness can lead you to confront things that are ugly, or dangerous, or wrong, uh, or confusing, and in ways that also I think are subversive because they force you to they force you to um, act against the the dominant narrative of the world. Uh, and I will just give one example from uh, my essay, which is walking in Chile. We, I was with an artist. Uh, at, we were at an artist residency. We went in search of a most famous river called the Bio Bio. It was once one of the most famous, was a legendary river of a powerful water flow that actually protected the Mapuche people from the Chilean or the Spanish uh, uh, conquistadores until the 19, middle of the 19th century. That kept them from being colonized because it was such a powerful river. But we have new ways of colonizing things uh, nowadays. And one of them is uh, neoliberalism, I guess we could say. And, and in this case, it takes the form of hydroelectric power. There are seven dams now on this river that have basically, um, that have, it, I forget the word that I use in, it's almost as if they gave the river a lobotomy, right? Yeah. Um, it, they subdued it. And so to read about that is one thing, but to walk to it, see a sign that says, prohibo el paso, can't go, uh, and then to go, which is what walking asks you to do, to confront something like this, I think is awakening. So walking, it's, a, it's subversive because it's awakening, mm -hmm. which is maybe kind of romantic too. It all comes yeah. around. Question online from Catherine. Oscar, if she wants to ask. Yeah, Catherine. Catherine, yeah. Catherine, Catherine, yeah. Catherine, Catherine. Yeah. Yes, um, I think I put that, you've, you've kind of answered the question because I put it in there a little while ago and I've just asked his walking as a subversive act or a resistance, a surrender is useful to the design process. But I mean, all design processes, I as an architect, I'm interested in terms of how it helps one become more aware of the city and the body in space and the movement through space and how that helps us understand the urban realm. So in all of the creative acts, not just writing, and writing may be a way of expressing it, but obviously there are other ways of expressing it through drawing and through other kind of video recordings. So I just wanted, I think you've been answering that uh, through your conversation anyway but just extending it beyond writing as well. I'm not sure there's a question there, actually. <laughs> it's really insane. I, know, I didn't completely understand the question. While you, were, while you were asking your question, I was thinking of something else. So if this doesn't answer your question, because I was thinking beyond writing, because one thing that we didn't yet talk about was the power of walking as a collective body and walking in protest and the long history of that. Um, that So Andrew, before we got on, just told us that there's now a law in England um, that you're not allowed to um, gather in public or you need extra permission to gather. So they're sort of um, squelching the idea of collective protest. I don't, that was, I was a surprise to me. Uh, we, talk, uh, we address that a little in the book, and Kalela, you, you really talk about it at the end of your essay, because um, the process of writing this, I should say that this book started being written at the end of 2019, and then um, we, you know, went into COVID, and then in the summer of 2020, not only did we have COVID, but we were facing um, a horrible election, and we were, had um, a black man was killed in Minneapolis that set off um, a summer of protests and um, sort of speaking truth to power um, movement um, in the, and in a way something that was activated by COVID because people were home 
during the pandemic, they weren't going to work and it got people out into the street and it was pretty amazing. And Kalela talks about that at the end of her essay and ties it into a historic context as well. So I don't know if you want to talk about that. And then, um, Catherine, we can try to answer your question too. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, it, it is interesting um, that, you know, I, I wrote my essay and then, um, um, Anne, at your suggestion later, and I, I had wanted to do this, but um, later I, I added um, this idea of protest um, to to it um, because it's absolutely, um, you know, we're seeing this more and more, and to me we're seeing the need for it more and more. Um, I mean, everything from, um, you know, what's happened in the United States, um, you know, with our constitutional rights um, uh, for reproductive health, um, and reproductive justice being struck down, having a right taken away because it's not deeply rooted in the Constitution. Don't get me started. Anyway, um, uh, you know, w w there's 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 a need for, in my opinion, um, there's a need for us to, for people to be able to gather and walk together and not just, you know, it's more than just holding up signs. It's also talking to each other. It's also connecting with each other. It's also gathering resources, you know, as one is walking. And and so, um, you know, I think that everything from, you know, the George uh, Floyd protest saw the largest worldwide protests in like that this this world has ever seen. Um, we've never had any. There's never been anything so expansive, and 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 huge. Um, and that and that there are entities in place that um, just like you know just like how African Americans historically have been excluded from mobility, there are there are elements in place like what you were just talking about in London that are trying to squelch everyone's ability to to gather and walk together and share together, and that to me is absolutely chilling and frightening, and um, it, it's something we we have to be vigilant against. I'm just to ask you a question. Oh, are, are all of your works or, or walks, are they very deterministic or are they non-deterministic? So do you allow for uh, accidents and improvisation and diversion and surprise? Or do you determine your work, walk and continue on that walk? Or do you, when you are walking, allow for serendipity and, and kind of move off in different directions? I think that is a phenomenal question, and I think that every contributor would answer differently. But for myself personally, I always determine the walk. I don't, it is rare. It is when I am in the company of friends visiting a new place and they want to show me a thing that my walks are improvised. I have a I have a view in mind, I have a place in mind, I have a body of water in mind, I'm a water person. Um, I have something in mind. Um, and that does tie to personally certain levels of safety. Um, I try to have a plan because the more relaxed my walk can get, the more uncertain I am of the environment I'm in, and I don't love that feeling. It takes away from the wall. But I think that's a phenomenal question. I'm curious to hear how my fellow contributors would answer. Thank you. Um, I I would say that there there there's uh, I like that question too because I think there are layers to it. I mean there there are times when you get diverted. You can I can get diverted in a walk or try something new or find try a different place but there's also just the question of no matter how um how much the route I, I, no matter how much i've determined the route there are still possibilities for surprises and for um you know a kind of improvisation or just a, an ability to meet the new thing uh on the same walk you know uh, uh, you can't step in the same river twice, and you can't often walk on the same sidewalk twice in some ways, depending on who else is there, uh, what time of year, what time of day even. Um, so I think there is a, again, there is a, a sense of, um, whether it's witness or 
uh, checking things out, from, but can be there can be a sense of discovery that happens, um, even in you know right outside your door, right down you know the most familiar you know well worn path that you have, especially in a place like a city like Philadelphia. Say something after this. Yeah, um, I wonder, um, Catherine, if you were asking if one sets out to walk for justice or if one just sets out to walk. And um, because I think those are two different kinds of walks. Um, and I would say, of course, walking, walking has the capacity to lead us across borders if, if we can follow that path, if, if, we can if we can keep going, if, if we feel safe enough and comfortable enough, or we feel like we can trust the world around us, then walking can allow us to cross borders and then experience something, you might become a different person if you do that. Um, and um, so I think there's a way in which that might be done for justice too, uh, but it may happen out of serendipity as, as you said. Um, do you wanna to add to that? Yeah, so I'm a, I'm a big believer in serendipity. Um, but that doesn't mean, and I often, like if he, I'm here, like I'm here in a city that I've never been to before, and one of my favorite things to do in the world is wander through a strange city and see what I find. But when there are times that I've gone on very specific walks and there's a satisfaction in that as well to have the route mapped out for the reasons um, Cabria has said that it, but there's, so the walk or the perimeter walk is an interesting example because we followed a very specific line of the city, the city map, but we didn't always know what we would encounter. So we um, decided, we called it, we started to call it the Roomba rule. I don't know if you have them in Europe, but Roombas are these vacuum cleaners that go around and they like knock into the wall and then they divert. And so it's sort of like we would we would walk as, as close as we could to the border. And then if we would get to a fence or get to something that we couldn't do, we had to figure out our way to get around. So we would like Roomba our way around the city. And that became part of the experience too, of sort of when can you, when can you walk straight? When can you follow the line? When do you have to diverge? And um, so that was really wonderful. Um, I have to say that I've um, done the perimeter walk the entire one a second time, I've done it nine times, which is amazing. And some of the people here have actually parts of it with me on a subsequent time. And so, so there, there's also something to say about, about repeating the same walk. And I think Daniel already talked a little bit about this and how you another way of knowing and not knowing. Because we're actually talking about this in writing the other day. It's also a good rule for writing. You, you have to, um, <laughs> <laughs> okay. Oh, Natalie. Uh, well, uh, uh, Natalie, do you want to uh, ask your question? I can't, can't see Natalie, so I am. Um, I'm just guessing. Can I? Yeah, go ahead, Joseph. Ask. Uh, um, 
can I ask Catherine a question because she was talking about uh, Catherine, you were talking about um, architecture and walking and how walking relates to different kinds of um, forms of uh, art or craft or whatever. And I just wanted to know um, if you were, you know, as, as an architect, how does I, I, I think there'd have to be a pretty um, strong um, direct uh, relationship between being able to move around a space before you, before you consider how to build on that space. I just wanted to know what you thought about the connection between walking and, and say your your you know form of art. Yes, um, for some reason I can't get my camera to work, so I'm not trying to be rude by not showing so that you can't see me, but for some reason it's not working, so I apologise for that. Yes, we start, any architectural project starts with walking around the city, understanding the city, understanding connections, because they're really important to make places work and actually to see where the barriers are and what type of barriers they might be, because they could be... They could be edges to districts in cities that are not necessarily parts of the city that you'd like to navigate because they may not be safe, or they may be barriers, physical kind of barriers, which can be dual carriageways in the UK, and it's, um, or it could be kind of railway lines that actually find uh, and reinforce a disconnect with the city. So students in architecture would always have to walk through through the city. I'm hoping that I can, um, that this is why I'm, I've, I've actually just ordered your book. <laughs> so I'm interested in other ways in which, those are ways that we traditionally start the site analysis process. And we will, we'd also do it at a different pace. So we might move fast or we might move slow. We might move individually or we might move in groups. And we record things in slightly different, in a variety of ways. And I'm interested in some, I wish I were with you in Girona, but unfortunately I wasn't able to attend. Um, I would quite, I'm interested in your book to see if there's some other way we can expand on our site analysis that we, we would always start drawing serial views. So we would look, stop and draw various kind of parts of the city. For us also, it's important to be static, so not to walk, where we stop in places and we just observe movement. So instead of us walking, we're actually observing movement and recording that movement, whether people are using it fast or slow, intensively or intermittently. So we gather all of that information at the beginning of every design project. It's important to actually do that. And it's the space between buildings that's also just as important as the buildings themselves. Does that answer your question? Yeah, but I thought I'd uh, in uh, and say I'm an urban designer. So uh, Catherine has just mentioned the space between buildings. And um, what urban designers try to do is actually to build serendipity in to the uh, spaces um, and that's something that you can do in urban areas but you can't from the periphery and that's what I'm kind of interested in is that you chose to walk and yes over time that uh, perimeter uh, has probably expanded and it's expanded in ways in which a, you could either be walking areas that you once walked. Um, and I'm kind of interested in, in, in that kind of thing. See, here in this medieval Could you speak? Oh, yeah, I can, I can speak. speak. Robert, uh, yeah, turn it off. We're going to use this. Okay, so what, what I was uh, just saying was that uh, many modern cities like to replicate the old city, where it's very easy to very easy to overlook the street, fall down no. from balcony to balcony have conversations with neighbours 
all these sorts of things are things that... No, uh, you have to speak much louder. Okay, are things that designers want to design into the modern city. You can't design that into uh, an automobile dominated, what we call peri-urban area, which is the outside, the areas, suburbia, and then you have the peri-urban, which is usually the perimeter of most modern cities will include cemeteries, uh, places um, you know, for refuse, um, for uh, dirty um, trans uh, transactions, sort of industrial uh, bod you know, uh, car body smashing or whatever, whatever's going on will go on on the periphery. And then what happens is the city expands out inevitably to create more of these spaces or to uh, capture more of the rural uh, and to make those more peri-urban and they're less walkable. Mm -hmm. So I'm kind of oh. interested in that yeah, kind they of, are good. And yeah. kind of in that in whether over time you've already seen that experience happening in Philadelphia. Yes, of course. I mean that I don't you can go Nathaniel. Yeah, I was just I was gonna say like a city that uh, has been around for three hundred and fifty years that has expanded out slowly over time each time creating a new edge, the new edge gets absorbed and parts of the city go through those different phases that you just talked about, out to the peri-urban. But I wanted to say, most importantly, that yes, we fetishize this kind of uh, urbanism that a place like a genuine, super old, uh, human scale built city is, and we are all enjoying ourselves walking around this place, but there's ways in which the, the border, the edge, has a human quality that urban designers and urban planners are always overlooking. They're messy. There's people who don't belong here or there and up there. And from a literary standpoint, walking on the urban edge is probably a lot more interesting than walking through ye cleaned up Oh, yes. oh, oh, uh, historic, center. historic center. I so. think also I want to add just from my experience of walking in places that you can't don't walk is that um, I think that the act of walking in those places actually can activate them and you find um, that it's not as bland as boring as you think and I think that if you can create more experiences for people to walk and places they can walk. I mean, Philadelphia is actually pretty amazing. It has this extensive park system. One of the borders way up in the north um, east, which is a very, uh, slurs, a very suburban part, is this creek, this beautiful creek, Pocessing Creek, that um, has, you know, it's somewhat maintained, but it's like I think people don't always know that that's accessible to them or it's not made accessible to them. I live not far from another border creek, um, Cobbs Creek, that has this beautiful park and walkway through it and it passes by a very old and beautiful cemetery that got run down and then has been reclaimed. But it's, um, it also has a huge um, kind of, not highway, but a, a very high speed road running by it. So there's been a lot of talk of how do you give people who live in these edges access to the nature that often exists there. So I feel like there are different kinds of experiences that you can create in the more, as you say, sort of edge environments. And um, I think in a city like Philadelphia where, you know, that was once an industrial power, but now that has waned, there are also really interesting things that you can do with that old infrastructure that um, is no longer usable. There's, I mean, someone is, there's a power plant that is being converted into an interesting space. We need more of it. We have some very bad, uh, sort of bad record of historic preservation at the moment. But those all are, and I think that's something that European cities do really well is sometimes activate these places that are on the edge, um, repurpose them, and make them into something that's dynamic. Um, that and as and layers on to its history. So I think. It's, it's true, and you don't, but I think there's something about creating places that are more walkable in places that were designed for the automobile. You're not gonna replicate the center, the historic center of a city that you amble around, but you could 
create these edge spaces that have much more to do with you're closer to nature, you have more trees, you have these places that you can go and experience, or even this gritty urban past that is now maybe that you can, you know, there's a way that you can access it and it's interesting as well. Um, so that, so I think I would say that. I would say to the extent that walking in a city is about seeing and experiencing and hearing and smelling and Repetition allows you to hear and see and smell deep, more deeply each time. Each time you're starting to see and hear and smell more things. So then you're starting to notice the layers that build up over time. And that's the magic of certain cities is, is that layering. At the edges is where you can really see the layers because development hasn't, you know, wiped everything out. So you can come in from Charles de Gaulle on the RER train into Paris and for 20 minutes see the edge of the city, the legendary edge of Paris, which, you know, depending on who you are and where you grew up, was a place of, you know, uh, getting over and hustling and uh, auto garages and um, dealers and all different kinds of things and cemeteries and little manufacturers and stuff like that. Like that's all that collects at the edge and because development doesn't touch there as quickly, you can see it for decades afterward, which is to me part of the joy of walking. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, now what I'm aware of is that Natalie, whom we couldn't communicate with, had written a question in the chat. So would you be able to read the question yeah, out? You can do. No, I haven't got my spectacles. I can assure you, <laughs> I can assure you, Babak, I cannot read it. So right. I'm hoping either you or Ged could read it out. Yeah, I'll read it. Um, Natalie said, um, uh, I think it is interesting that there is a long-standing debate between the merits of walking alone and walking together collectively. It seems that they serve different purposes, with solo walking being almost meditative and an opportunity to discover at our own pace whereas walking with others allows us to see a different perspective, something we wouldn't have uncovered on our own. Protest walks fit into this narrative by providing the opportunity for a collective to present something that is being overlooked. I am interested to hear in your practices if you balance between walking alone and with others, or if you have a specific preference for one over the other. Go ahead, somebody. Somebody out there. Somebody out there. One of our other three. Or even somebody here. Somebody here, but yes. Yeah. Speak up. <laughs> walking alone, walking together. I, I would say there's value in yeah. both. Um, I, I'm not sure, sorry if I'm jumping in too much. Um, yeah. Go, go. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, walking by myself is sort of when I do my thought writing with, you know, my, my thought work with writing. Um, but that's also to say that like my boyfriend and I can walk together and I can talk through a problem that I'm going through like in a story. Um, and I'll talk about it like it's an actual problem I'm having in life, you know, like, oh, well, you know, this and this and this. And he's like, well, what about this? And what about this? And it's, it's this interesting conversation. And I think walking in a group is also um, can be meditative. Like if you're if you're speaking about a certain thing or talking about, um, you know, it, it leads to conversation. Um, especially when you're walking with friends. So I think that, um, I, I don't know if I'm sort of answering the question, but um, I, I would say there's value in everything. Yeah, I would I would agree with that. I like to do both Ralph as well. Had, Ralph, Ralph, go ahead, Ralph. 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 This is yeah, Ralph. It's all you, Ralph. Ralph. Just, uh, yeah. If I'm um, walking with other people, hi, I'm Ralph. <laughs> <laughs> Just uh, walking with other people, um, I can't hear. I can't hear myself. I can't hear what I'm walking in because it's all, I'm forced, one, to be social social and sociable. Like I go walking with my wife, for example, with friends. Sorry to um, impugn my wife who is not here. <laughs> but but um, I've noticed they spend all their time walking. Um, I can't hear, so I need, I'm a writer, I'm a poet and writer, I, and located audio producer, I need to hear things. To hear things, I need to be and see things, and I, so I need to be on my own. Okay, Clara, we're going to get it. Um,
Can talk to you right here. Shall I, shall I go? Yeah, it works. Yeah. Okay. So yes, this experience also I have felt, but uh, I want to explain an experience that I have also felt in these eight years of Grand Tour, which is a group walk of three weeks. And uh, it, this, and, is uh, the, and, this is the uh, this is the concept uh, what I what I have called compass. I was feeling that uh, people were joining for this walk in different dates, and there were people that hadn't met uh, before, previously. And I was amazed at the um, speed in which people would uh, get uh, in communication with the other, which was much more uh, rapid, much more quick than in any social activity. So I was very curious about that. And slowly, slowly, I observed that the thing that makes people together is the body, is the fit compass. So when they wanted to stay together, sometimes it was that or to have a conversation of a very deep uh, content. But other ways, other times was very basic, very plain, like, oh, it's very hot today. But in any case, they would put their feet in compass. Because all of us walk in different compasses, but if you want to be beside someone else, you have to compass. So I discovered that this very organic thing makes your mind, because of your body, in communication with the body of the other and because of the body of the other, in communication with the mind of the other, with beyond language. So um, for me, it was amazing, and I think it's one of the most beautiful uh, good values of working in group, is this joining of body and mind by uh, compassing. And then thinking about that, I discovered well, I thought that, in fact, in, in uh, dance, in, uh, you know, salon dance, or even in some kinds of sports, you have this compassing that allows the body to go first than language or first than mind, and that makes the things very easy sometimes. Yeah, hello. I'm Anna, uh, and I'm... I did a lot of writing, but I was like writing doing wars because uh, sometimes in a group walking in very dangerous situations with refugees, for example, and then you really have the compass of the dragon. I mean, you have to be careful for everything. It's a question of trusting the body that is walking, uh, yes. but not trusting. Can you hear me? Yeah. Not trusting what is. Um, around you, your, so your, your surroundings aren't trustful. And then you really have like 100 eyes. Uh, but you are also very aware of your own responsibility. For example, not to make noise or um, not to be afraid or not saying, no, you never can say, uh, I'm thirsty because everyone has thirst. Uh, so this is another kind of group walking. Um, but I think that's very important. Uh, and this is the compass also. Yes. Yeah. I think I want to say something again to answer that question about, because I agree for me both. I mean, I would say I'm like Halela that I, there are advantages to both. But I want to say that um, to talk about the book is there um, both kinds of experiences are explored. Um, there are some people who have solo walk experiences. Um, one of the essays, the one that, about the woman as an archaeologist who decided to ride, walk the entire Via Appia Antica is interesting because she moves from times when she's walking with other people to times when she's walking alone and talks a lot about the difference of that experience and, and also how if you've been walking with someone else, you know, especially alone as a woman, 
then and then and then you transition to walking alone what that is like because that's also you have to make those um, transitions um, from they're two di because they are two different kinds of experiences and uh, so I think they're in this book what one of the things I was aiming to do was really get um, a myriad of experiences of like how looking at what is the solo walk what's the personal walk a lot of these walks are not about we've talked a lot about you know thinking about history thinking about the layers of history thinking about urban space but some are very very personal stories about walks you know somebody taking a walk with her father and then her father dies and she's walking after her father died and what did the, what did those two different kinds of walking mean so um, that there's there's a range of that in this book that um, there's not one answer there's so many that's why it's called ways of walking there are a lot of ways of walking yes I, I think there is a very important factor in the walking yeah, we have to get your Sorry. face on the camera hello everyone I, I think there is a very important factor in walking that is temporality because I do long distance walking mm -hmm. myself and then I find myself oh, like on the point by talking to the computer oh. I find myself on the point you were saying that a time I walk together and time I walk alone and then I am alone together with other people and it is very fascinating what actually happened in the mechanism of when you walk in for many many kilometers uh, I walk from Italy from England to Italy then there is the point in which actually the walking is becoming so important on, in every single possible relation with the entire world and yeah. not only with the, with people which yeah. is what well, i find it very fascinating no that is true have an essay like that <laughs> <laughs> yeah and the, uh, the idea i mean we didn't really long distances because that all does affect how you walk and that you get to if you're walking on long distance um you get to the point where you're you really are just in your body and whether you're by yourself or with other people I mean, I've never done a long distance walk except for with other people but and there's also these times when you can because even when you're on a long distance walk with other people where everybody needs to be alone for a while they're just kind of separated in their head and then there's this sort of natural flow of moving together and moving apart which is really wonderful and um, you know you start hurting you start getting tired and you're aware of all that how that affects your perception so it's a really important way of experiencing that's an important way of walking yes, sure. oh okay uh, sorry Esther if you're there would you like to ask the question that you have Escher. Escher, I beg your pardon. Is Escher there? Yes, hi, we're here. This is a, It's a combination of, of me and my mother Elizabeth's mm -hmm. question. I, I just, uh, hi. <laughs> well, here, we're in Seattle, and um, the Duwamish people have, uh, next to their river, and is a very industrial, uh, industrial area that's very toxic to everyone who lives in that area, which of course is mostly low income. And uh, there's an attempt to reclaim the river. And um, so I was just wondering, I guess, again, walking as activism, uh, how issues of environmental justice could be addressed. <laughs> I, mean, I think that's a great question yeah. um, first of all by being present in those spaces it seems to me is the what happens when the, there are parts of the earth which are forgetting the term now toxic zones they're basically dead zones of earth right and the people that make those zones they're not actually people they're multinational corporations whatever industrial processes create these places that are an ecologically dead zone and they count on us not to go there of course they put signs up saying you shouldn't go there it's dangerous which may or may not be true but the point is you have to go and you have to use it and you have to see what nature is doing herself to place 
And I think that beginning, that begins an opening. The thing about walking is that it puts you in personal communion, face to face with whatever it is. And that's where you start to become aware. And then that awareness can grow. Uh, if you turn your back and say, ah, we can't deal with this, or too dangerous, or isn't that a shame, I won't go there, or it looks better, it smells bad, then there's no way of that. We have to start by making a step. And I think the other thing that happens when you walk, and especially if you're you know, looking out for this, or if you come across areas that are toxic, that um, is understanding the connections between places. So um, one of the, you know, on the, I mean, that was one of the great things about the perimeter walk is that you kind of started to see like this whole extensive infrastructure of energy and how that takes up various kinds of land and looking to where those polluters are. We passed um, several, I think at least two uh, that I can think of, and there might be three super fun sites, which um, are being now the people who live in that neighborhood are working, have to fight with the government to remediate them. But it's, I think one of the things that happens when you walk is in a way it becomes your problem too. You can't be not be aware of it. You are, um, I mean, this is very not, I'm kind of echoing or it's a variation of what Nathaniel said, but that you, it belongs to you. I think that by walking as opposed to driving through a space and thinking, oh, that's over there, it, it starts to belong to you. It's in your consciousness. You feel it's part of something you've experienced, especially if you're doing that walk in the place you live or near the place you live and you realize that this place that I think of way out there is actually not that far away. We, we heard a talk this morning that part from Daniel who was saying, well, you know, you walk out of Sao Paulo and it's so close to the rainforest and nobody who lives in Sao Paulo even thinks that they're close to the rainforest. And um, so that the, the walking, because you have to keep um, moving through, you make those connections. And I think that is also a way to move to environmental justice is because you think about the connections, you think about ecology, you think about the network of how things, how things work. Okay. Okay, well, yeah. we, we better make this the last question because of the timing. Yep. So, because uh, we're wrapping this up at 45. I right, haven't we have got something a clock, else to but do. I'm about 45. Okay. Uh, no, I, I think we'll go for the last question and then perhaps a last word from um, Anne and uh, Nathalia. But yeah, let's have the question. Okay, Carmig. Hi, Carmig. Hi, sorry. I didn't realize. Uh, okay, I'm. I, and, uh, but here I am. Hi. <laughs> So let's see. Now I got to find my question. Uh, it was, uh, I, I well, I, 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 I want to know. Could someone please elaborate on Natalie's statement? Protests fit into this narrative by providing the opportunity for a collective to present something that is being overlooked. I, I really like that statement, Natalie, and I'm hoping. Uh, some of the, the writers of the contributors to the book could uh, elaborate on that. Say that again, say that again, the collective. I should go back to Natalie's original question, which was, okay, so, so Natalie wrote, it, or it seems that they, uh, walking alone versus walking collectively, which you discussed, it seems that they serve different purposes with solo walking being almost meditative and an opportunity to discover at our own pace, whereas walking with other allows us to see just different perspectives, something we wouldn't have covered, uncovered on our own. Protest walks fit into this na narrative 
by providing the opportunity for a collective to present something that is being okay. overlooked. Uh, I just, I really, uh, I, I like that idea of walking as, uh, as a way of communicating just the act of walking. And um, I was just interested in how you Walker writers saw that, saw that. <laughs> Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I'll, I'll go again and then we'll see if someone else has something to say to that. Um, I mean, one of the things that answer to the environmental justice question, and this is related, is that recently in Philadelphia, um, there's a group of uh, Quaker um, environmental justice group called Equate that is um, sort of taking that idea of walking to make people aware of what, um, well, this is what Vanguard, a big investment company, has been, do, where they've been best in um, the fossil fuel industry and trying to get them to divest from it. But they've been doing it by doing a long walk where they're going to places that Vanguard has been investing in that are like there's a huge incinerator south of Philadelphia that, um, and really sort of follow, so doing this research, following the money, but then putting that by um, walking, sort of showing that these are these places and these are these places that are connected and the walk culminated with going to Vanguard headquarters with protest signs and they had signs all along the way. So that's a way that you make your cause public. People drive by, they see what you're wearing and what you're saying. And then um, so going, that culminated at a confrontation at Vanguard about trying to get them to divest. And it, it, that's still going on, but this was a five day walk that um, I think address that of, of using the walk, not just as a protest, the conventional kind of protest where you're gathering and have signs and um, that's very powerful too. But this was one where there was also this um, component of revealing what was there in the landscape as you walk through. I don't know if that helps answer the question. If any, the rest of you have any good examples to answer that. Well, I, I I I love that, Anne. That's 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 great. But yeah, I, I'm all ears. If other people have <laughs> other things to say, I think it's a great example of what you're asking about, um, and it really really speaks to the ways that walking is a multi is a polyformic. Way of being, way of being a member of a democracy. Yeah. So I think maybe it would be worthwhile to conclude with bringing this back to what it means to be a person in a in a in a um, political space because we all occupy political space and how hard it is to be in a political space if you can't show up with your body that political space isn't going to function very well. And we're seeing that in the United States very, very well. There are examples in other parts of the world, obviously. But uh, if you can't feel safe and be in public space and express yourself with your body and use your body to be next to someone else, then you can't function in, in a democracy. Um, and so that's why we walk. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. Okay, well, uh, I am going to wrap this up, and so I'm going to say, um, Nathaniel and Anne, thank you very much for stimulating the discussion and conversation, and Anne, I want you to just give the book a good plug now. Okay. okay. And then we're going to say thank you to everyone, including the other authors yes. who came online. Yes, thank you so much for showing up. <laughs> and I want to say from um, the West Coast. Um, I mean, it's the, Elizabeth was from Seattle. Mac is all, Carmeg is also in Seattle. So who came and that's um, still early in the morning where you are. So thank you for showing up. Um, 
this is the book again, Ways of Walking, published by New Door Books. Um, it is available online through bookshop.org or Amazon. For those who are here at the conference, I have a few copies, and I also have a um, flyer with some QR codes so you can order it. Okay, so we have takers here. Those of you who are watching at home and who don't have the book yet, go to your bookstore. Go to your bookstore. And bookshop.org, if you're in the U.S., is a good way to support independent bookstores. So. Um, or go to your, uh, if you're in Philadelphia, I know a novel idea on Passion has several in stock that are now, um, that are actually signed by many of the authors who came to our live launch that was in May. So you can go there. And I just want to give a special thanks to Justin, Kalela, and Cabria for coming and talking, and it worked out. It was great. And I also want to thank sitting here is Doug Gordon, who is our publisher and um, has done for, of New Door Books and was an extremely good, ex well, excellent copy editor and has been very involved in the um, process. And Miriam Seidel is also here who designed this beautiful cover. So I want to thank them all and thank you for joining us in Spain today. And um, I think it's actually cooler in Philadelphia than it is in Spain. So enjoy. <laughs> All right now, it feels good. Thank it you. It feels Andrew. good right now. And thank, thank you, to... Andrew. Here, and, and Baba, Baba for walk, listen, create, and you should tune in to their other programs because they're wonderful and we're learning a lot about walking here in Spain. So this was wonderful. Great to see you all. Thank you so much, Andrew. Thank you for inviting us to do this. It's been a pleasure. Bye.